Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this VLB event. It's the first of a number of events that we plan to hold this autumn. Of course, our world and just about everybody's world has been changed by the virus. So we've been very sad that we had to cancel our spring conference and the award ceremony, and also, of course, the upcoming November autumn conference. Sorry. But we're delighted that we are able to have several of these events over the next few weeks. And we're in particular delighted that the first of these events we have to David Clementi, chair of the BBC, and as the moderator and chair of this session, Dame Colette Bow. Uh, Dame Colette is, of course, a former uh, president of the uh, VLB or organization, and also, and very relevantly, the former chair of Ofcom. So welcome and thank you to you both. Just a couple of small matters. We will be trying to have a Q&A after Sir David has spoken. If you have a question to send in, there is a button at the bottom right-hand uh, section of the screen. And send us a question by email. Please do so. We've had quite a lot of questions sent in already in advance, but we will get to as many questions as we can. So welcome again, and over to Colette to welcome David and introduce him Thank you very much, Colin, and hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here at a VLV event. I'm delighted that we're able to welcome this morning David Clementi. David, as we all know, has been chair of the BBC since early 2017. And it has, of course, been a rather, uh, at times, a rather tumultuous period for the BBC, but perhaps that is, that goes with the territory. Perhaps there is never a time when it's tumultuous at the BBC. So without further ado, I am going to, uh, in a moment, ask David to talk to us about his time as, as chair. After that, we will then go to uh, the Q&A session. So David, over to you. Uh, well, morning, everyone, and thank you, thank you, Colette. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back once again uh, with the VLV, albeit virtually. I've learned in this role that a huge number of people describe themselves as a critical friend of the BBC, but that in practice the turn encompasses a huge range of opinion from those who, in truth, want to change the BBC so much that it becomes unrecognisable to those who do want to see change, but adhere strongly to the principles that underlie the corporation, editorial independence, distinctive programming, universal funding, and universal responsibilities. I'm happy to say that I've always found VLV members towards the constructive end of this spectrum. Despite our many strengths, the challenges the BBC faces today are significant and they've intensified over the last decade. The environment in which we operate is increasingly dominated by the giant tech players, largely from the US. We also face significant financial challenges, not least because the license fee for UK public services relative to 2010 is 31% below where it would be if it had tracked inflation. We know the significant reform is necessary. But too often, this is a debate that has become clouded by politicians and opinion formers with strong views and even stronger rhetoric, full of assertion and light on analysis. Our new Director General Tim Davey in his first speech was clear about where his priorities lie. His four point plan included a renewal of our commitment to impartiality, intense focus on unique high impact content, the need to extract more value from online, and the need to build our commercial income. All these are deeply important, but over the next period, and in particular, in the run up to the next charter, at board level, we need to think carefully about three broad, long-term questions around the BBC. And the first question is, is there still a role today for public service broadcasting free of commercial and political pressures in its day-to-day -day running? And if the answer to that question is yes, then the second question is, what services do we want the BBC to provide as a PSB? And the third question is, what would these services cost 
and what is the best way to fund them? Asking the questions in this order may seem self-evident, but if you look back at the 2015-16 Charter Review, you'll see that the third question was dealt with ahead of a proper debate on questions one and two. The then Chancellor George Osborne announced the financial settlement in respect of the new charter in the summer of 2015, shortly after that year's election. John Whittingdale, the Secretary of State, then carried out a year-long review about the role of PSPs and what we wanted from the BBC. He presented this in the government's white paper of May 2016, with the new charter starting in 2017. This reversal of the proper process, allowing the funding to define the purposes and scope, shouldn't be repeated. I don't intend to provide definitive answers today, and certainly on the question of the funding mechanism, it's worth reminding ourselves that there is still time for a full debate, since the Charter makes clear that the licence fee will be the primary funding model until the end of 2027. But I do want to make a few comments on the first two questions. And the first one again is, is there still a role today for PSBs? I think that the events of the last few months have provided their own emphatic answer. On the day that lockdown was first announced, close to 45 million people came to the BBC to understand what was happening. In the week that followed, 94% of the British people used the BBC and 86% of those aged 16 to 34. Millions came to our national and regional TV news bulletins for essential information and insight. Notwithstanding the multiplicity of choice in front of today's consumer, the BBC plays three critical roles for the country. First, we should recognise what the BBC does for the UK's creative industries and culture. Certainly the industry recognises our contribution and it's repeatedly warned against any move to dislodge the creative ecology that has grown up around the BBC, urging that it's crucial to the UK's greatest success. Second, we should also recognise what the BBC does for communities around our nations and regions. There's been much discussion in recent months about the need to level up our society. The BBC has long had the goal of being the media organisation that is most fully embedded and distributed around the UK. A decade ago, a third of the BBC was based outside London. Today it's half, and we've doubled the proportion of programmes produced in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Our base in Salford is now home to around 3,500 people. And we've invested also in Glasgow, Belfast, Cardiff and Bristol, where BBC hubs act as magnets for the whole creative sector. It's worth reminding ourselves that the 6.30 p.m. regional news is the most watched news programme and almost certainly the single most important moment for explaining lockdown rules in different regions. And when it comes to the importance of our local radio stations this year, from the floods to the pandemic, has proved just what an essential service they perform. At least one MP has described us as the, the fourth emergency service. Third, we need to recognise what the BBC does for Britain around the world. Our global services now reach 468 million people outside the UK, up 11% in the last year. We remain one of Britain's strongest and best known brands, the preeminent provider to the world of facts you can trust, synonymous with British values of quality and fairness. A recent Reuters Institute study found the BBC News to be more trusted in the US than all of their major domestic news brands. And thanks to the government's investment in the World Service in 2016, we've been able to substantially expand our global role and we can go much further in the years ahead as a great force for Britain in the world. So we think there is a clear case to be made for the role of relevance of PSBs, and we're making this case strongly to Ofcom in the context of their PSB review. We want them to recognise that in order for PSBs to thrive, we can no longer afford to have linear regulation in the digital age. We have to explore how we can cut red tape and speed up the regulatory process. We want them to recommend legislation that will ensure services like iPlayer are both included and prominent on all major platforms. And above all, we want them to support a universal license fee funded BBC. It's the cornerstone of one of the most successful creative sectors in the world. 
Let me now say uh, something about a subscription model as an alternative to a PSB model. Those with an objection to public service broadcasting and to a universal funding model call for a shift to a Netflix style subscription. Quite apart from the fact that it makes little sense to compare the range and depth of services provided by the BBC locally, nationally and globally with what is on offer from streaming services, there are two important flaws in this argument. The first is, is, a, is a technical issue. Audience still largely consume BBC output over traditional free-to-air television and radio stations. There is simply no way to cut off access as you can with other services like, like Sky or a utility. This will be the case until everything and everyone is online and that world is still some time away. The media minister, John Whittingdale, has himself pointed this out, telling proponents of the subscription model earlier this year that this is currently utterly impossible for the great majority of British content. The second major flaw is more substantive. A subscription service at its heart is a commercial contract between media provider and subscriber. The provider offers what the customer wants. It's not dictated by a license or some outside party. I've said before that I have no doubt the BBC could thrive as a subscription model, but it would not be the BBC that the nation knows and values. It would be guided not by principles of independent and distinctiveness set down in our charter, but by a determination to maximize subscription income. And that commercial imperative would require management to sacrifice many of the services currently on offer. A subscription service would be unlikely to have much regional presence. It would not fund anything like the amount of money that the BBC at present puts into the nations and regions in television and local radio. A subscription service would not have invested a significant amount in a new head office in Cardiff to be used by all in the creative sector in Wales. It would not fund Welsh language television, S4C, to the tune of nearly £75 million. It would not have invested in a new channel in Scotland. A subscription service would be very unlikely to continue the level of properly curated programmes for children, or indeed the brilliant bite-sized education services that have helped so many pupils parents and teachers alike in recent months. A subscription service would not have the same commitment to investing in homegrown ideas and talent to the benefit of the whole creative sector. Sitting behind a paywall, it would no longer be the place that brings the whole of the country together for shared moments or important events, from Olympic success to Gavin and Stacey on Christmas Day or, or perhaps the V Day 75th anniversary celebrations. Nor, of course, would it continue to contribute 250 million currently taken from the license fee to fund the World Service. This cost would largely revert to government. Those who promote, and there are a lot of them around, those who promote the notion of a subscription service brush aside these points. They rarely grapple with the technical problems. They do not explain how radio is to be paid for. They do not engage with the commercial reality of a subscription service nor do they point out to the public the types of investment, programmes and services that would be lost. Their argument is largely ideological, based on principle that argues against any public intervention. The subscription proponents promote the service as consistent with the theory of consumer sovereignty. But the UK's creative industries in broadcasting, in theatre and other performing arts, indeed across the whole cultural sector, have never been built on this principle. Instead, these industries and their global economic success were built on a rather enlightened blend of the free market and smart universal interventions, of which the BBC is a prime example. This mixed ecology is a national success story and something we should be fiercely proud of, something we should be seeking to build on, not undermine. My own view is that the case for BSB at a time of increasing polarization of opinion, growth of social media and related rise of fake news has never been more important. So if the answer to my first question about PSBs is yes, we move, we move on to the second question. What services do we want the BBC to provide in its role as a PSB? Earlier this year, Ofcom published its review into how PSBs perform for UK audiences 
in the five years from 2014 to 2018. It was clear on the challenges, but it also underlined as its first key finding that audiences continue to highly value the purposes of PSP, including trustworthy news and programmes that show different aspects of UK life and culture. That finding from Ofcom is a useful starting point. We believe the BBC's role as provider of trustworthy news is important, perhaps more important and relevant than has ever been. We've taken significant steps in recent years to combat the rise of disinformation and fight back against fake news. We are by far the British public's most trusted source of news and we rank number one for impartiality. When audiences ask where they are most likely to turn for news they trust the most, 62% say the BBC, up from 51% last year. Turning from inform to educate, Nobody doubts the important role we play during lockdown. When schools closed, every pupil, parent and teacher in the country was able to rely on curriculum-led lessons on the BBC for every age group, every day. Although the BBC has long held to the Rethian triplet that our purpose is to inform, educate and entertain, it's only since 2017 that this has been formally incorporated into our charter. There remains some who argue that the first two elements should be remain and should be part of a core PSB, but that entertainment is provided by others, there is no market failure in this area, and that therefore the third leg of the Rethian mission should be set aside. This argument ignores a number of key points. The first is that one of the reasons programmes such as drama and comedy are done well by the commercial sector is that they have to match the standards the BBC sets. Over the past four years, the BBC has won over 600 awards in every genre, up by more than a third on the previous four years, and much of this is down to Charlotte Moore and her world-class team. We raise the bar for the whole sector and drive up quality for everyone, and audiences are the biggest winners. The second point goes back to that Ofcom finding audiences highly valued programmes that show different aspects of UK life and culture. In stark contrast to the global streaming services, the BBC has a clear responsibility to reflect and represent the lives of those we serve. We're fully uh, committed to supporting and championing the full spectrum of British talent, writers, actors, directors, and more. And we help sustain thousands of independent production companies and suppliers up and down the country. Since this is a sector that pre-COVID was growing at five times the rate of the wider economy and one in which the UK punches well above its weight, it's not clear why any government would want to cut it back. This isn't just an economic issue, but also a cultural one. Cultural influence from across the Atlantic is, flat, is fine if it adds to our choice, less so if it comes at the cost of our own distinctively British culture. A third argument in favour of preserving the BBC's three-part mission is that the BBC is at its very best, its most distinctive and relevant, when it does all three at the same time. Who can argue that Sir David Attenborough's natural history programmes do not have their remarkable impact because they entertain every bit as much as they educate and inform? Let me, uh, let me uh, uh, conclude. Uh, at the BBC, we know we need to reform. Guided by our relationship with our audiences, we need to engage closely and positively in the process of change. Political pressures aside, the market is changing rapidly and we need to respond. But in looking to change, let's not risk undermining what makes the BBC such a priceless asset for Britain. As a national broadcaster committed to political independence, impartiality and universality, we are the envy of the world. It would be an extraordinary act of self-harm if, as the UK seeks to forge a new role for itself on the global stage, we were to diminish one of the few, very few British organisations that is truly world-class. Collette, that uh, uh, completes uh, by prepared remarks, and, and I look forward to the Q&A session. David, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about there, 
and uh, we already have a number of uh, questions coming in. Um, I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to kick off, David, by inviting you to look back over your tenure um, in the chair of the BBC. I said at the outset uh, you'd you'd had a few challenges to contend with. Um, what 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 were the what do you feel have been the biggest challenges you've you've had to deal with? Uh, look, uh, two two uh, overriding relating challenges that are really evergreen. Uh, my predecessors faced them, and my successors will face them. And the first is the growth of competition. Uh, the days of the duopoly are long gone. And the, but for, for, for a couple of decades, there was a four way split between ourselves, ITV, Channel 4, and Sky. But of course, the competitive landscape has changed significantly with the arrival of streamers. Uh, many of them with excellent content, a uh, really tough competition. And alongside them, also the social media, we'll talk a bit no doubt about Facebook and YouTube, but they are big competitors uh, for those uh, uh, seeking engagement from 16 to 34 year olds. So the competition uh, has been an important part of, of my time and will continue. So also financial challenges. Whilst many of our competitors have huge balance sheets, our main source of funding the license fee relative to 2010 is, as I said, 31% uh, below where it would have been if it had tracked inflation. And, and even if it had tracked inflation, we would still have to work hard because some of the genres, sport and drama, the costs are rising much quicker. I guess uh, uh, I spent probably more time on the uh, issue of over 75s uh, than any other, any other issue. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, a very difficult decision. Uh, we think in the end, Although others disagree, we think we reached a fair decision, fair to those over 75, since we sought to help those who are the most uh, on the lowest incomes. And fair to all our audiences, it's as if we uh, replicated the concession for everybody, we would have uh, had to make, well, it would have cost us £750 million. We would have had to make very, very substantial uh, changes to our schedules. Uh, thank you very much, David. On that, on that last point, David, a question has come in from Camilla, who is saying to us, well, um, how are you going to persuade a different generation who sees um, paying for content as optional? How are you going to continue to persuade them to pay something that is not optional? Well, I think we will continue, uh, and my speech was certainly intended to be evidence there, to argue the case for PSBs uh, uh, free to air. It is true that the license fee is, is, uh, is compulsory, uh, and we could talk a moment, in a moment if you like about decrim, but uh, we will continue to make the case strongly that PSBs, and, and if we compare that with the streaming service, none of the streaming services provide anything like the range of services that we do. Uh, they entertain, certainly, and they, uh, they have some outstanding content. But I think in terms of inform and educate, as well as entertain, uh, uh, the BBC uh, ranks supreme. And I think that the case is a strong one. It's one I've sought to make, and I hope my successor uh, will continue to make. So do you want to say a word or two about decriminalization, David? Well, uh, I know you're using the much easier to say decrim as a shorthand for that. Which yes, it's probably is we, 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 we go in for the abbreviated version of decrim. Uh, I mean, you asked about uh, past challenges and future challenges. No question that one of the things which is now pretty much top of the agenda uh, for the board is the 21-22 license fee renewal, which will take place over the next... Uh, a year or so and my successor will need to be heavily involved in that and we've started work on it and it will be caught up on the issue of, uh, of, of decriminalization where we're in discussion with government it's an opportunity for me to say that there are two great myths about decrim the first is that it takes up a lot of court time it doesn't statistics show it takes up about less than 0.3 percent of court time the second great myth is you get sent to jail uh, if you don't pay the license fee it's simply untrue you get a fine only if you willfully uh, refuse to pay a whole raft of court fines might might a, a court impose a custodial sentence. But even then, it's extremely rare. Almost nobody is sent to prison uh, for that purpose. So it's a chance for me to say uh, how wrong that is. We have drawn the government's attention to the Perry Report. The Perry Report was an independent report produced in the run-up to the last charter. And Perry 
concluded that decrim would lead to additional costs for the BBC, something like 200 to 250 million pounds per annum, higher fines and increased court time. So uh, we are up for the debate. We're making our case, we're discussing it with the government, but it would not pass the logic test uh, if we were to swap the current system for one which costs more and where that cost falls on law abiding citizens. Thank you very much, David. That's a very clear statement. I'd now like to move on to a very interesting question from Max Goldbart of Broadcast Magazine. Max, you've asked, with budgets challenged, which they obviously are, David, um, it's realistic, isn't it, that we will see whole departments or services cut between now and the next charter? Um, is, is that a realistic assumption, David? And if so, what might have to be cut? Uh, look, I think uh, uh, Tim Davey, uh, in his first speech, set out the challenge of actually producing fewer hours, uh, but he did so against background, not so much of uh, budgetary cuts as set matter, but more an absolute determination uh, to uh, achieve content of high distinction. So the challenge he's put to every uh, uh, budget holder, every content uh, producer, is if you were told to produce uh, less hours, but you still have the same budget, how would you spend it? Because some of our material is quite outstanding in the area of documentaries, and I know uh, one of your uh, viewers was concerned about uh, that we shouldn't lose things like Sue Perkins' view of the uh, uh, along the US-Mexico border, that we should not cut back on that sort of genre. Actually, I could say that in that sort of genre, the Iraq uh, documentary outstanding, the Murdoch uh, uh, one, the three-part Murdoch one, for those who haven't seen, absolutely riveting. Uh, and although we all know or think we know everything about Trump, by the way, the two-parter on Trump on iPlay at the moment is quite outstanding. I think that uh, the, the challenge from the Director General uh, to everybody in the run-up to our formalising our budgets, which will happen <laughs> in February, March, our year starts in April, uh, is, is to everybody, if we produce less, where would we spend that additional money and how can we ensure that the BBC content is truly distinctive? It's against that background uh, that he has put out uh, uh, that challenge. I think to, uh, I hope we won't see any closure of any departments, but obviously uh, that depends on where we get to on the license fee negotiation. Uh, we will make the case uh, strongly that our range of content uh, uh, it does things that other people can't do and don't do uh, and that we should not be badly cut back. Thanks, David. Um, on, on a similar sort of theme, Robert Beveridge has asked, um, should the licence fee payer continue to pay for the World Service? Uh, well, as I said in my speech, if we were subscription services, it certainly wouldn't do it. I mean, I don't see uh, uh, subscription services uh, moving into that, and, and it's a perfectly decent question. We get some value out of the World Service. I mean, on the one hand, there is now, it used to be run as a very separate organization. It's now rather more integrated with our news services. And we do use quite a lot of the footage produced by the World Service in our own domestic uh, six and the six o'clock and the 10 o'clock news. So there's more interchange. And I think there's no question the World Service has also played an important part in raising the profile and the reputation of the BBC worldwide. So some small payment, for the world service might be uh, might be possible but plainly if we are cut back substantially uh, uh, all areas of the BBC will need to be looked at uh, and this is one area we currently spend about 250 million of licenses it's a very substantial amount of license fee on the world service which is primarily but not solely primarily there to support uh, the soft power uh, wishes of government thank you David um just uh Continuing on the, the, the financial theme, David, do you think um, that over the next few years we'll see a change in the balance between uh, licence fee revenue and revenue from commercial activities? Uh, well, I hope we will. Uh, uh, Tim Davis sets that out of the fourth of his priorities, four priorities to increase uh, 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 our commercial income. Uh, and we need to do it because there is a limit how far the license fee uh, will rise. I hope it will continue to rise in line with inflation. But as we know, that doesn't actually take into account uh, superinflation in certain genres. So uh, I'm fully supportive of the borders of Tim's 
uh, wish to see the commercial income rise. Uh, we need to build a studio's uh, contribution. It does make a substantial contribution, has a handful of uh, programs, Top Gear, Strictly, Doctor Who, the Blue Planet series that uh, are shown around the world and is a good earner, but we need to add to that list. There are opportunities too for us in, in direct to consumer services, and we are, uh, as you know, one of the major shareholders of Britbox. Uh, that's doing very well in America. It's had a good start in the UK, and the plan is to roll that out around the world. We've also recently taken over full control of some of the UK TV channels, including Dave. So we'll want to increase our opportunities in that direct to consumer market. We'll also be entering into uh, partnerships with, with some big players like uh, Discovery and Tencent. And we already have with uh, Discovery a big uh, joint venture involved in uh, natural history programs. So we, we, we must build up our commercial income. Uh, and I think we're fortunate that Tim, who is at the top of the organization, is, is in the perfect position to do it. He comes from that background. He understands the market very well. And I have confidence that he will achieve his ambitions. Thank you, David. I, just, just thinking about that, I, I wonder whether, and, and by the way, I can, I'm completely with you on this, but I'm trying to think of a, a sort of um, challenge to that. If what we're saying, and Bob Usherwood, who's sent in a question, has put this very well. Bob Usherwood has said in, in a comment rather than a question, the BBC is a public good. And that was very much a theme of your talk, David. Yeah. Um, and uh, Bob has, you know, uh, linked this to the question of, of the BBC being financed out of um, tax uh, revenue. Do you think, however, David, that to the extent that the BBC is successful in increasing its commercial income in the way you and Tim Davy are contemplating, um, do you think there's a danger that that starts to sort of undermine the, the public good argument for the, the BBC and the licence fee? Look, I think there must, uh, that's an interesting article, uh, 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 argument, and rather more convincing to me than the crowdy out argument I occasionally hear. I occasionally hear people saying, you know, the BBC is crowding people out uh, of the market, certainly in television. I can't see that at all. But it was, as you'll remember, Colette, although you weren't personally responsible for it, behind the original decision of the competition authorities not to allow uh, Project Kangaroo. Indeed, Indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, the only regulator who was determined that the foreigners should have a real stake in that, in that service before the, uh, the indigenous players were allowed to participate. It's an interesting regulatory principle. Eh? Uh, so uh, I'm not much uh, persuaded by the crowding out argument. I think the public good argument is interesting. Will, will uh, building up our uh, commercial income take our eye or in any way dilute the yeah. main part of the BBC, which is a public service broadcaster? And I think it's, it's a reasonable point, and we go to some lengths to ensure that it doesn't happen. Uh, almost every board meeting, our lens is essentially at the board through PSB, and we see yeah. the income from studios, et cetera, as just a good and alleviating the burden on the uh, license fee pair. We also have very strict rules set out by Ofcom and within our license about any possible cross subsidization uh, and, and the contestability regime, for example, is very carefully policed to make sure that we don't use uh, our, uh, the benefits we get from being a licensed fee recipients to actually promote our commercial operations. I think it's a reasonably good, uh, I think it's actually a very interesting point and not one for my successor to lose sight of. Mm. But I think we have the, uh, we have the uh, ways of dealing with it within our internal constitution. Thank you, David. Um, David, I'd now like to move on to talk about accountability, which is another element of what you've been yeah. discussing this morning, of course, because as a, a public good, taxpayer funded, there's plainly enormous need for the BBC to be, to be genuine about accountability, yeah. not to just go through the motions and say, well, of course, not accountable. But would you like to tell us more about what you feel you've achieved on that score over your time as chairman? Um, well, there are moments we think we are the most accountable organisation around. When I think of the uh, efforts of the NAO or Ofcom or various other parties mm -hmm. to keep interest in what we're up to, everybody thinks uh, 
uh, uh, they should have a look at us. But actually, Ofcom is important, and we're certainly accountable for our, uh, meeting the license uh, conditions to them. We have a formal accountability uh, to Parliament, not as you know, to ministers. Our accountability is to Parliament, uh, and, and that isn't just a, a store accountability. Uh, we appeared, Tim and I appeared in front of the DCMS committee a couple of weeks ago, and we were grilled for three and a half hours. Uh, uh, you could have watched it on the parliamentary channel if you were if you were keen to do so. A lot of accountability to the DCMS, who summon us quite regularly. We're summoned by the POC at least once a year to explain some aspects of our accounts. Uh, we are accountable too to the nations, uh, the devolved nations, uh, and we appear in front of their appropriate uh, committees. So parliamentary uh, accountability is, is strong. Audience accountability is very important, and and. We have sought, and this is an example of it, Colette, we have sought to appear in front of our audiences in various yeah. guises to actually explain what we're doing and for people to ask questions. Tim has actually, in the two months he's been the Director General, has done a lot of audience engagements with the RTS and other organisations. Uh, and through our Nations and Regions Committees, we now have actually quite a formalised process of meeting 13 or 14 times a year with different uh, uh, focus groups, if you like, of 20 or 30 audience members, often uh, by uh, socio-democratic uh, breakdowns or, uh, or, or, or some other means. We, we, I've been regulated in, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, and throughout England on some of these uh, 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 audience engagement sessions. Uh, I think uh, another way in which we're accountable, needless to say, is through the complaints. We, uh, we devote a lot of time to dealing with complaints. Many of them aren't complaints at all. They're actually people who just want to express their views. Mm -hmm. but we get over 100,000 a year and we spend a great deal of time responding to them. Uh, I think that, I know the VLV and Colin may, may want to speak there. The VLV has thought hard about this and, and would like to see some sort of citizens forum, uh, which would increase uh, audience accountability. And we aren't against that in principle. I think the issue is how would, how would uh, such a, a forum be appointed and how would it be representative, given the, the different breakdowns regionally and by age group? But I think we certainly recognize the need to be accountable. We think we do a huge amount in this space, but we, we are open to further thoughts. Yes, I'm interested in that Citizens Forum idea, David. And I must say, I, um, they're, they're quite hard to get right, those kind of events. But I would hope that the BBC would be able to do more of those not least because it enables you to move away from some of the things we've talked about this morning which are about finance and all of that and perhaps get more into questions about for example um somebody on the call ruth silla of york has asked about impartiality um yeah. you know people are very very interested in how you strike the right balance between a proper due impartiality, I beg your pardon, that's the expression, isn't it? Due impartiality and um, giving sort of airtime to views that are very sort yeah. of marginal. Um, a, a, another sort of question about those kind of um, judgments um, comes from um, um, Sally Ann, uh, I beg your pardon, um, another uh, colleague on the call who is saying, um, you know, people sometimes feel that important news stories are missed by the BBC because there is a strong BBC um, sense of, you know, what, what constitutes the important, the important um, news. Um, Elaine Cox has raised this question that, um, you know, there is a legitimate criticism in some quarters that, the BBC has a, what you might call a liberal political bias. Now, you know, one man's, one woman's liberal political bias is another woman's impartiality. But would you like to just say a bit of a word about due impartiality, David? Well, uh, let me, yeah, I will. Uh, let me just uh, uh, wrap it up there in the question of audience sessions, because you learn a lot from meeting audiences. Uh, and a lot of it is actually concentrated on, on content, some of it on impartiality. On content, you learn that there are a whole raft of people out there who think that Peaky Blinders is a, a Netflix show. I uh, have no idea that it was originated by the BBC. Uh, and, and you learn a lot about uh, how they spend their viewing hours and what they think. 
Uh, I think you learn a lot about impartiality too. There is a general trend. We do a lot of impartiality surveys and it shows that uh, about a quarter of our audience think we lean uh, uh, to the left and, and slightly less, but nevertheless a very substantial number think we lean to the right. But the interesting thing about it is it's very age related. Yeah. Uh, once you get over 50, there are a significant number of people who are convinced uh, that we all live in Islington uh, and that we're all, you know, whatever, uh, uh, they're convinced of it. Uh, but if you, if you speak to uh, 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 a younger generation, they occasionally think we're part of the establishment uh, and, and we lean to the right. When I was up in uh, Salford earlier this year giving a speech, I gave it at the School of Journalism. Uh, it was in February. Uh, and I, uh, after the speech, six or seven young students came up to me to berate me on the BBC's performance in the last election, the December election, which they said had been so heavily biased towards the Conservatives, they couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, it, it, there is a very big age-related issue around the matter of impartiality. Uh, we take it seriously uh, and, and getting letters from uh, two people both arguing in different directions that we've yeah. failed it doesn't prove that we are right but we work incredibly hard at it uh, we have many editorial guidelines and tim not because i think we have necessarily done it badly i think for the great great majority of our output we are very good has made this priority number one we are doubling down on impartiality thank you david and by the way um um speaking as somebody who does live in islington I'd be quite grateful if you, if we could not have anti-Islington comments on this Zoom, please, David, well, if you don't mind. Just, they just believe that I'm your neighbour, <laughs> uh, uh. Now, uh, still on the subject of, uh, of um, content and the news, David, there's a very interesting question here from Chris Hayden of the Community TV Trust, who is raising the question about the negativity of a lot of news output. And he's, he's raising an interesting question, which is one, as you know, people often raise, which is, um, what about sharing some positive stories of achievement? This is often sort of sneered at, but what do you, what do you think, David? I, look, I don't sneer at it at all. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we need to get a balance and I agree. Uh, this is not a moment, there never is a moment. For, for a news bulletin of pure negativity. Uh, uh, so actually I'm, I'm sympathetic to that point and I know that our newscasters think about it, our editors think about it very carefully. You'll see that most normally, particularly in our regional news, which as I've indicated is mm. the most newspaper. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I watch the London news with Rizal Latif. There are it's generally some very upbeat stories, you know, really uh, quite emotional stories of people who overcome hardship or communities doing really useful things in the arts. Uh, so although uh, we may not do it to the extent that your, uh, uh, your questioner wants, it's something of which we're aware and, and no doubt we can do more. Uh, as I say, the regional news is good at it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the question, David, really is, could we see a bit more on the mainstream? But that's, that's for you guys to... to there, are moments, to there are moments of royal weddings. Yeah. Uh, nobody does uh, royal weddings and royal occasions. Or... or uh, I don't know whether it was good news or bad news, but our coverage of the V-Day or the VJ uh, celebrations, I thought was outstanding. Considering it was, it was cracking, yeah. COVID. I mean, it was emotional, but also very uplifting. I thought they did a great job. Uh, and a lot of that would have been on the news, but if you actually watch the program produced by our current uh, uh, events team, I thought it was brilliantly done. And, and, and as I say, uplifting. It was indeed, David. And, um... I think everybody who, who followed it would, would want to agree with that. Now, David, we're starting to come to the end of our session and it won't surprise you one little bit that many of our members are very interested in the process for the selection of your successor. And people are asking a number of questions which are partly about process and partly um, uh, trying to tease tease you i mean maggie maggie brown our friend maggie brown is um yep. is raising this question by asking who would be your ideal successor um max gold part of, of broadcast is asking so and quite a few is colleagues going to apply? sorry is maggie going to apply well i think we should know actually i think we'd we'd quite like to know 
um, if she's going to throw her hat into the ring. But I suppose, David, the way to um, perhaps um, perhaps the way to make this this helpful for colleagues is um, would you like to tell us a bit about the process by which you became chairman? I think people yeah. would find that quite interesting to know. Um, uh, Max uh, of Broadcast has said um, you, when you were in front of the DCMS committee that you, you talked quite a lot about Charles Moore and all that. Um, uh, Maggie, as I say, is, is saying who's, who's the ideal successor apart from her. All right. Um, well, David, can you give us a bit on, on the process? And by the way, I'm emphatically not asking you to talk about names here, but a bit about yeah. process and, and perhaps, David, in the light of your own extensive experience of this job now, what, what do you think the person doing it needs to have? Uh, yeah, the character. Okay, let me say something about the process uh, uh, and then the attributes. Uh, on the process, uh, the charter makes clear that there needs to be an open and fair competition. Uh, of course, so does our, uh, the guidelines on public appointments, uh, of which uh, Peter Riddle is the uh, uh, overseer. But that uh, set of uh, guidelines can be overridden by ministers. Uh, but the charter cannot be. The charter says it has to be an open and fair uh, competition. And that must mean that uh, it should be advertised, and it has been advertised, uh, and that uh, there is no predetermined winner of the event. Uh, I think that's important, and it's a point I made uh, clearly. The government should do its best to encourage a wide number of people yeah. to apply uh, and not try to predetermine a winner. Uh, uh, and I said that at the DCMS uh, committee. The process is people apply, uh, have to fill in some forms, uh, and then they uh, are summoned uh, to an interview, a, a panel, which I think we already know is going to be chaired by the permanent secretary of the DCMS. Uh, it's their job to distinguish between those people who are appointable uh, and those who are not. And I suspect uh, they will have uh, two or three people who will be appointable and that they then send those names to ministers and the final decision uh, rests with ministers. They will then have a preferred candidate at that point and the preferred candidate finally has to appear for a pre-appointment hearing in front of the DCMS. It would be possible for government to override a vote from the uh, DCMS committee, but uh, would that be wise? It would be difficult for a candidate to start if they're not actually being approved, uh, to believe they have the credibility if they're not actually being approved by the DCMS committee. So that is the process, and it's the process I went through. I appeared uh, in front of a panel, which was then chaired by the then uh, DCMS Permanent Secretary Suen. Uh, uh, I was deemed appointable. My name, I think, along with a couple of others, I went up to ministers. I was interviewed by uh, Secretary of State, uh, deemed to be the preferred candidate, and then appeared in front of the uh, uh, pre-appointment hearing. Actually, at the pre-appointment hearing, because this goes to the question of attributes, just before I went in for my pre-appointment hearing, I met Peter Bottomley. Some of you will know Peter, and he is now the father of the house, I believe. And he said to me, actually, uh, the chair of the BBC needs three things. So they need a thick skin, they need a large uh, slice of luck, and they need a big umbrella, no doubt. <laughs> four things. And I suspect that that remains as true uh, uh, now as it was then. I, I suppose there are two other thing attributes. I, I mean, it would be good to have a chair who actually was interested uh, in broadcasting and content. I find that too many of the people I talk to with very strong views about the BBC actually don't spend much time with the BBC. They get up with today and go to bed with Newsnight, but they don't watch much in between. And that's not surprising in some respects, they're very busy uh, politicians or businessmen, but they don't actually engage with the content that their constituents engage with. Uh, but it doesn't stop many of them having very strong views about the BBC. So a genuine interest in, in content broadcasting, radio and television would be good. Uh, some experience of chairing, I occasionally read the chair is going to appoint or disappoint this person. It's not the way it works. Decisions of that nature are made by the board. So somebody who wants to influence the BBC needs to be a good chair. Uh, and I think, and it's a point that's self-evident, I think, but worth repeating, whatever their background, whatever their personal politics, they need to leave that at the door. They are the person 
who oversees finality, the, the impartiality of the BBC, and they need to demonstrate at every turn that they are politically impartial. Thank you, David. That's very, very clear. You, you mentioned the three bits of um, advice Peter Bottomby gave as you were going in for your um, pre-appointment scrutiny. What have you needed your biggest umbrella for in this in this <laughs> time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, worst moments and best moments. Yeah. Can I start? Can I start with the worst moments? Yeah, start with the worst and then go on to the best. Uh, look, it's 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 almost a mistake like, to talk about the worst. So, since I have four months to go, and uh, <laughs> tomorrow morning there might be something on my desk <laughs> causing me to leap around and and uh, yes. and uh, worry. I have to say, I've been. Uh, in some respects, fortunately, there haven't been a lot of noises uh, uh, and, and a lot of difficulties, but there's no moment where I felt we've lost control or none of the really, really big hits uh, that one or two of my uh, predecessors yes. uh, faced. So I wouldn't say any low moments, but I think, I, let, I mean, two, I mean, any of these jobs have their difficult moments, and I would pick out, say, two. The first uh, was when uh, our regulators decided to hold up the changes we sought to make to iPlay, it's self-evident to us that we were losing ground to Netflix. We wanted to expand the number of box sets uh, on iPlayer. We wanted to increase the availability of content from three months to 12 months. It seemed to us fairly straightforward. This is absolutely what our audiences wanted. And there could be no question of crowding out since Netflix had taken the lion's share of that market. Uh, but we were held up for 12 months and that was a, a significant uh, irritant. Uh, and a concern. I think I said that the most difficult uh, decision we've had to take was on the over 75s. Uh, we think what we eventually decided was fair, but uh, 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 we were constantly, constantly met by claims by the press and politicians that in the 2015 settlement, which predated my arrival, but that in the 2015 settlement, the BBC had agreed to replicate the government's concessions was regularly thrown at us. It was completely untrue. Both John Whittingdale on behalf of the government and Tony Hall on behalf of the BBC had been on record at the time of the 2015 settlement that some sort of reform was quite likely. Nevertheless, the canard that we had agreed to replicate the concession was regularly rolled out. Mm. Uh, anxious to deflect criticism from government to the BBC. And I say that was uh, uh, very unfortunate. But I think in terms of really bad moments, uh, not yet, but as I say, four months to go. On good moments, look, plenty of them, and plenty of them, and for my success, if they like content. Uh, I love Strictly. Uh, the ringtone on my phone is known to be the Strictly theme tune. Uh, I'm a great fan, and it's great, by the way, to see it back on air uh, last Saturday and next Saturday and all the Saturdays up to Christmas. Uh, I get to go occasionally. But I think my highlight, I have to tell you my highlight so far, was going to a, uh, a live recording of Dead Ringers, uh, where John Culshaw in a skit, dealing with a viewer's complaint, impersonated me as chair of the BBC. I went up to him afterwards and said, John, I love the show, but that the impersonation was nothing like me. <laughs> it was well, his reply was, well, keep talking for a few minutes, David, and then I'll get you. Ah, I like it. I don't so, know what he's done. So, David, given your love for Strictly, are we going to see you in the next series? Maybe? Definitely. Is this a little hint of a future? Into very, very good dancers, but I'm not one of them. No, definitely viewer. Well, we shall, we shall watch out for it. But um, Colette, Colette, do you want us to put, I'm occasionally asked for names to put forward. For Strictly, or to be for chairman of the BBC, or both? <laughs> <laughs> for Strictly. The, uh, the ex-home secretary is on this year's show. Good luck to her. Yes, I, I saw that. Um, I'm, I'm not really, a, I'm not a very good dancer, David, so I think it might be, also, <laughs> as I live in Islington, it might be a bit too, um, you know, a bit, a bit much. David, I think we are just about to run out of time, but before we, we do, I'd just like to say we, I don't think we've really talked about radio this morning. And I just wondered if you'd like to say a few words to us about the importance the corporation is attaching to radio. As, as we know, it's, you know, the radio on is 
how most of us live our lives and um, yeah. say Look, a word. I, I, in talking about content, uh, we like to cover uh, both uh, radio and TV and, and online, but I think it is important to touch on radio. I think it's hugely important. I mean, it is the way we communicate hour after hour with huge numbers of our audiences. Mm. Tim again has said on the same channel, he's made clear that we don't want to see any more channels, but we need to make clear that on our existing uh, offering, we are once again offering people a real, really distinctive radio. Uh, all of us have our favorite station. Uh, mine is easily listening on radio too. Probably for the reason that uh, your listener uh, asked a little while ago, it's more uplifting than Radio 4, which has quite a lot of the, uh, the difficult stuff. Radio 2, if you're driving, is much easier listening. That's a very, that's a very nice uh, thought on, on which to end, David. Um, now, I'm just quickly seeing whether we have any further important topics, but I think we've covered a lot of ground this morning, David, including your views about, or you, you've told us about the process by which you were appointed. You've talked to us about the, the challenges the corporation faces, but you've expressed to us very clearly, David, the pride you have felt in being able to chair this great national and international institution. On behalf of the VLV, David, I would like to take a moment just to thank you very much on behalf of all of us for what you have done in, in the chair. Thank you. And I'm now going to hand back to Colin Brown. Thank you. Good, thanks, Colette. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, David. For what I think was a really interesting, informative, and entertaining session. I shall be left in my mind with this vision of uh, Sir David and Colette meeting together in a future world on Strictly Come Dancing, providing the ultimate. Thank you again. Thank you to everybody involved in organizing today's event. It's the first such event which ILV has had. But as I mentioned earlier, we have got a series of events coming up in November including on the original date of our the, uh, conference, the 24th of November, we'll be having another online event. And I can reveal this morning that one of the people, uh, guests on that will be Peter Pesselyet, chair of ITV and of course president of all television. I hope that as many of you as possible will join us for that. I also mentioned earlier that we had no award ceremony this year for obvious reasons. But we will be announcing our awards in the coming year. So please like to know more about that. So once again, thanks to Sir David, thanks to Dame Colette, thanks to everybody involved, and I hope you'll find it as useful and interesting as I have. Thanks very much. Goodbye. <laughs>